I'd like to what? It's okay, Jen. I'd like to welcome everyone to the third lecture in the Brodsky series for the advancement of library conservation. Tonight's topic is the aesthetics of book conservation, or as Gary has it here, quiet drama, the art of book conservation. And this is a topic that should appeal to a very broad audience, conservators, book artists, and those responsible for the curatorial care of our collections. Gary Frost is an educator in book arts and book conservation. He has taught at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Newberry Library, Columbia University in New York, and the University of Texas at Austin. Currently, he's the conservator for libraries at the University of Iowa, another program with a long history. Um, from the Newberry, Gary followed Paul Banks, the founder of the conservation program at, the Newberry, at Columbia University, to um, Columbia, and then followed the program to Austin when it moved there. At both these programs, he contributed greatly to the training of generations of library conservation and preservation professionals. And by generations, I'm not saying he's been doing it for 100 years, but you, know, you see a lot of turnover in physicians and people coming into the field. And he's had a huge impact. Um, Gary is noted as one of the true thinkers of the field in the field of library conservation. He's always asking questions. Um, why we, as conservators, do what we do? Are we doing the right thing? Does it work? Um, and looking, for the, looking to the past for guidance in preserving our literary and cultural heritage. He continues to develop innovative structures based on the success stories of the past, such as the sewn boards binding that is based on the Coptic style. This is something that our workshop attendees will have the opportunity to explore this weekend. And I see a number of you in the audience. It's great that you could make it. Um, in addition to greatly influence our work, influencing our work as conservators, these explorations have also had a direct effect on the book arts, something which should not surprise, as so many conservators are also practicing book artists and vice versa. Um, a special honor for Gary was that this year he was honored with the 2006 Paul Banks and I forget what Harris's first name is, Preservation Award, which is given by Alex, the Alex Division of the American Library Association, an award which was also received by our first Brodsky speaker, John Dean, in 2002. Um, I'd also like to thank Joan Brodsky for making this series possible. She's here and makes a point of being here every year, which is great. So let's all join her and me in welcoming Gary Frost, our speaker this evening. Funky mouse. That's that's just the mic for that. So. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, it's, it's really I really feel gratified to um, have such a uh, already attentive uh, but a, a, such a large audience and I I find this uh, topic uh, interesting enough, but um, it, uh, it is itself kind of inex inexplicable. I'm going to be um, adventuring on the topic of the aesthetics of book conservation. Uh, I suspect that every practitioner has uh, an embedded sense of what those issues are and what the uh, investments are. but I, to my knowledge, it's never really been um, played out uh, in terms of maybe some rationales, and so I'm going to try that. Uh, I'm actually going to work with some offhand comments that I've heard different conservators use, and I realize that it is in those uh, um, effervescent moments that many times practitioners will reveal an underlying uh, perception and underlying destiny that they felt in their work. So let's uh, take that uh, as a starting point. Um, I also think there's a, an aesthetic stance, much uh, as uh, you might say th that each of us has a stance, something where we stand and where, where we wish to project and uh, advocate from. And so that, I think, is an aesthetic issue as well. 
And the reason that that is more of a, an aesthetic uh, issue is that uh, for the first time, um, we feel, uh, in the, living in this generation, uh, that the destiny and the future of the print-based collections in the context of digital delivery and screen reading are now um, teetering, are now in play. And so that's a very exciting um, moment and uh, also a, uh, an opportunity for taking this uh, stance relative to the physical book and uh, generally in tradition uh, in terms of the uh, paper and print collections. So that's a kind of uh, an opening uh, uh, position. Peter, uh, I just click it or? Um, click the mouse. On your oh, sure enough. Right click, huh? There you are. Peter, I, I was uh, um, struck that this is an auditorium uh, in honor of Peter Graham, the two Peters. Uh, in my, in my uh, um, acknowledgement and in my experience, that's, uh, we, we lost Ross Atkinson at the Cornell and of course Peter as well. And so the, uh, I'm just a uh, practitioner in the conservation area, but we do have uh, these wonderful legacy librarians uh, standing uh, with us in, in interest in, in preservation as well. So I was very gratified to see that dedication. Well, here we are. Betty Bright was here last time. This is almost a, a segue. The, uh, the book, I'm sure she uh, relayed to, uh, related uh, to it. Betty Bright just uh, uh, published this um, exposition on uh, recent history in the book arts. And she does uh, refer, as Peter uh, just did, uh, to the art of the book conservator. But really that uh, byway, she calls it a byway, um, she's referring to book art made by book conservators, not the artful treatment of books. And this evening I'm going to make that distinction that I'm actually just talking about uh, art uh, fulfilled uh, physical treatments of, of books. But she did have the byway in there. And so we're kind of going through the refrigerator door, we're going to the byway into the kitchen through the refrigerator door uh, into a consideration of the artful uh, treatments of books themselves. Well, does the book art, uh, the art of the book conservator, align with any of the categories described in Betty Bright's book? The heritage of book uh, production arts are involved, but they're involved ambiguously. While the book conservation field values the regimes of craft apprenticeship, it is also suspicious of commercial methods. Likewise, relations with the aesthetics of the private press, the deluxe book publication, and the array of multiple and unique book works produced by artists are a mixture of respect and irrelevance to the topic. So what we have to deal with here now is, is teasing out uh, the aesthetics of the practice of book conservation itself. Betty concludes, and I think does cross the line into exactly what we're talking about. She concludes her book with this graceful expression, quote, imagine the absorbed reader at the point when turn, a turning page reaches the height of its arch. At this pause, the reader inhabits a space of emotion and intellectual readiness, one full of question, possibility, and anticipation. End of Betty's quote. The book conservator imagines this episode multiplied and sees the book itself as the live mechanism that conveys conceptual works across time and cultures and through the hands of all its readers. This power of imagination of the book conservator 
is an artful contribution to the art of the book. Well, I mentioned that uh, I wanted to uh, enter this door, enter this refrigerator door in the kitchen of the topic uh, by uh, just taking some offhand uh, remarks that I have personally heard and uh, personally uh, uh, faced off uh, with uh, the four individuals here uh, on this. Uh, the, the top is uh, Chris Clarkson's quote out of his early uh, study of the vellum bindings, but uh, it's as much uh, his everyday expression as anything else. Paul's actually comes from, uh, I think it's 10, um, uh, euphemisms that he always conveyed, uh, such things as uh, no treatment is reversible, and uh, so on and so forth, that authenticity cannot be restored. Don Etherington, this kind of strung together for me, or, uh, my early experience, um, let's see, that was in, um, what was 70, 74. There was a lottery, uh, I was at the Library of Congress, there was a lottery, uh, uh, that went on that uh, would uh, establish what hour the president would resign uh, in that instance. And uh, quite a lot of money was at stake. Um, but among other things, I, I crossed over for the first time with Don. And then finally, Peter, uh, the third uh, Peter this evening that's come up. But uh, unfortunately, Peter, has, uh, Peter Waters has also uh, passed away. Another uh, wonderful legacy person. Uh, in our own specialty. So I'm going to start uh, with these on the screen and then I'm going to play them out because though they are, if you will, uh, one-liners, uh, giveaway lines, I, I believe they're um, apertures into uh, underlying aesthetics that each of these individuals had and uh, can be shared by us all. Unique character. Well, where did that one come from? Uh, this is this is the one that Chris uh, exemplifies. He was um, just called to uh, uh, an eighth century psalter was found in a bog in Ireland just a couple months ago. Um, he was called to the National Museum in Ireland uh, to see the bog book. Uh, a little limp uh, mm, leather-covered book dug out of a bog from the seven, 700s. And he went to the enclave, and um, there were all the specialists, of course, in archaeological conservation and the retrieval of items. Why did they need Chris there? Well, Chris does know. Chris does know what an 8th century Psalter in this uh, environment should be and what it should look like but more than that, he knows what it means that the 8th century Psalter survived and is witness in the contemporary setting. And that was al must be almost the reason why all these specialists called him in. They wanted to know what does this thing mean, and Chris uh, would be an ex exemplary person for interpreting that. He uh, is a student of the unique character of physical objects that convey forward the period of their production. At its best, this is from Chris, at its best, craftsmanship and conservation is not simply a skillful use of tools and materials, but a knowledge and sympathy for the volume and the period of its production. The book conservator uh, this is not Chris, this is just me blathering now. <laughs> but uh, the book conservator meets each book with an expectation of some message from a past era and from an ecology of the world of artifacts. This is a twist on the theme of the paratext, and it does extend the aesthetic performance of books. The book conservator looks for evidences of deterioration, survival, and vintage scenes embedded in the artifact as an inherent content. content. Uh, Paul would always say this too. Uh, the uh, physical form of the book is, is content as well. 
The book Conservators Forensic also extends to signage of previous makers of the book, literally re-watching the motions of stitches, folder scores, gloving of covers, or death snipping of the corner miters. The careful book opening and closing manipulations of the book conservator are somewhat slow motion because of this quiet, small drama. The actual talismanic retrieval out of physical objects of another time, a culture, and then of other people. Many times, the counterpart of the very person, the book conservator, uh, his, uh, that person's counterpart way, way back in time. Before and afters are uh, part of case history, as you always see before and afters. You can see them uh, in uh, hair salons, right? Before and after, you can see them in beauticians' parlors. You can see them, of course, in uh, book uh, conservation uh, case histories. Uh, fo following the treatment, the appearance is where much of the outcome is assessed. If you go in, to be uh, enhanced or beautified or otherwise uh, made um, more poised than when you came in, you're going to look at it before and after and look at that after uh, assessment. The intent uh, in this aesthetics of book conservation is an elegant, ordinary appearance with a timeless quality. It's kind of uh, evasive, but uh, and also a, a treacherous aesthetic uh, challenge. Such an aesthetic of the ordinary, conveyed by an attractive yet omissive appearance, is uh, an artistic challenge. The unremarkable appearance of one binding among others goes unnoticed, though all but one is from the 16th or 17th century. How to make the book in its appearance, dis disappear among contemporary uh, books of its, uh, that it uh, alludes to and uh, undoubtedly the text block uh, relates to. This is from Don Etherington, don't fidget. I see a lot of fidgeting sometimes uh, in, as I watch practitioners. Decisive speed exemplifies experienced craft work. The practice needs only a few tools, a bone folder, a sanding stick, and a cutting out knife. And the book conservator, in terms of an aesthetic challenge, will work gracefully, accurately, with an elegant, syncopated, Speed. Many times you'll see in the literature of book conservation, you'll see this schizophrenia, where you have methodologies, namely the knowledge of working with your hands explained, or you'll have uh, preservation agendas or scenarios uh, explained, but not the two of them together. But to meet the aesthetic challenge of book conservation, you actually would need, I would offer, to syncopate the two mind uh, prompting the hands and hands uh, prompting the mind, the two in a kind of a equipoise of, of uh, uh, action. And so that, that is an important uh, challenge. The work should not be, as, as Don said, lumpy, tedious, precious, or angst-ridden, whatever that means. It can't be any of those um, <coughs> uh, dilemma states. Fidgeting with innumerable surgical tools and de dental tools is an in indicator of crippled technique. The book conservator must bring a choreography and a spirit of dance to the treatment, providing a refreshing kinesiology for the old and tired book. Doesn't sound too bad, a massage. <laughs> Well, here are some of the greats. There's Bill Anthony there, uh, uh, Tony Kane's up uh, in the top, Peter Waters, and of course, uh, Chris, Chris Clarkson down there, uh, standing in for Don Etherington, uh, showing their, their, their skill, their speed, their syncopation, uh, their direct uh, work, uh, workmanship in this case, but uh, their uh, capacity to work. Uh, quickly and easily and elegantly. 
Well, here's an interesting one. Um, authenticity cannot be restored. Why did Paul say that? Well, probably for the same reason that my supervisor, Nancy Kraft, says, let the artifact tell its own story. <laughs> what, a, what a good guidepost. <clears throat> Book conservation is justified by balancing the, dis the disruption of treatment against the damage projected if a physically and chemically vulnerable artifact is continued in use. Libraries are places where books are used. They're not libraries where, um, uh, uh, libraries are not uh, what we'll call steady state uh, uh, ex exhibition uh, facilities. Uh, they, they need to have materials that actually, however old, are still able to be read. So that's an aesthetic challenge uh, to balance the disruption of treatment uh, with the preservation of the uh, object. One of the, one of the clues here is that uh, frequently conservators will be talking about the condition of an object. And you have to be careful when, uh, when a book conservator says it's in good condition. That person might mean that the book is in fragments in a bushel basket, but it's in good condition. And the reason it's in good condition is that it has survived undisrupted from the period of its production. It doesn't mean that the book itself is acting physically intact. It, it may not be, but it's in good condition vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the survival of its authenticity and its evidence and its uh, story. Certain materials deserve protection from disruption or refabrication. When undertaken, the treatment processes should be relatively reversible. The story that the book has to offer should be told by the artifact and not the conservator. Uh, I'll give you a good example of uh, an author, a book uh, which has authenticity uh, that cannot be restored, uh, simply because I, I've always used it as an, as an example. It's the log of the ship that Herman Melville sailed on. <laughs> and of course, you can't do anything to the log of the ship that Herman Melville sailed on that will make it any iota more the log of the ship that Herman Melville sailed on. So that's a good uh, clue as to uh, how the conservator might step back a bit from uh, any need to refabricate these materials. An affection of our own culture, uh, we have some good ones and the bad ones in our own context here in the uh, USA, um, is a preference for a clean copy rather than the dirty original. This is something that's built into our whole, uh, if you will, consumerist uh, ethos toward the physical world. Um, you sometimes see people uh, you know, you could think, we, we could each think of dozens of examples. Uh, someone will put a, a quarter in the newspaper machine, open up the door, see that there's a slight frill, ruffled frill on the first copy and reach for the second copy. That's culturally induced, uh, I would offer, uh, that uh, we, we try to find that uh, inviolate uh, shrink wrap enclosure around our, our products. And so this does pass over into this dangerous area of conserving the authenticity of uh, library collections. The book conservator, this is, uh, this is one of those questions of stance, the book conservator must meet this culture bias and others, advocates for digital surrogates and screen-based presentation of print books must be engaged by the conservator wherever the status of the original is in question. It's not so much the books we could lose, we could lose the status of the books as originals to their screen-based surrogates. This very difficult course of advocating this in the context of library budgets, in the context of momentum towards uh, uh, digital delivery and uh, digital research uh, agendas and uh, digital services and libraries. 
This very difficult course um, must convey the continuing role of the original in the context of digital delivery. Two useful arguments here, two useful contentions are that all meaning resides in the original. Whatever meaning is brought up in the Google distillation, in the parsing of the book, that doesn't accrue to the surrogate, it accrues to the original. Now whatever that is, the 8th century uh, bog psalter, that's where the meaning went. That's where the meaning goes. That's a, a very important argument. The other is that meaning in the original always awaits further discovery and unknowable future queries. What did we learn about um, filming the newspapers? We learned that we didn't get the complete meaning out of the newspapers from this perspective. And it turns out that we can never anticipate the range of future queries, nor can we really ourselves in our cloistered time uh, imagine uh, the full meaning of the original. So those are two good arguments that I, I like to bring forward. They, they don't uh, uh, provide much mo momentum uh, for our side, but now th this, this is a, an issue that needs to be brought forward. We come now to the last of the admonitions, and this is Peter Waters, make it flow. Peter uh, was a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, pianist and a student of uh, classical uh, music, uh, a wonderful designer binder. Uh, and when he said this, and I remember the context, what he meant was to make it um, enlivened and make it mobile, make it animated, make it flow. He was talking about drawing on the boards into that timeless parabola where the wooden boards are drawn onto the book and you get this elegant parabola across the back of the book. The book conservator is a restorer of mobility and without, <clears throat> without that result, the work is ugly. A haptic aesthetic motivates the conservator with effective transmission of forces and pliant response to handling, the book will protect and conserve itself. An achievement of supple book action. Well, I, I could have gone backward, but I don't know how to do it. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's all right. Where am I? I'm in the wrong menu. Kind of seeing obliquely. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Not the toolbar. Oh, here we are. Oh, this one right here. That's it. You would think I'm, uh, we've had a um, uh, view. What if I do this? Will it bring that up full screen? This is fun. <laughs> Tony Kane's uh, Book of Armagh on the left. I don't know what this other oriental is. Long Stitch, uh, The Paradox. How does a book with a rigid spine open flat? Well, it has to do with the escalator of the non uh, adhesive folds. But in any event, um, that was an interesting interlude. Uh, Emily Martin and I are uh, 
very interested to see how, how PowerPoint can be used. Um, and we, won't, we don't need to go there now. Uh, <laughs> An achievement of supple book action is rather invisible to the library reader, but this characteristic is deliberately achieved by the book conservator. The protective, supple, and pliant action enables older books to survive photocopying or scanning, exhibition, and general mishandling by the modern reader. A rejuvenated flexibility and a rejuvenated transmission of opening and closing motions aesthetically distinguishes the, the curative conservation treatment of a pre previously crippled book action. Such, such action is only partly assured by appropriate structure. Structure and action and action. They're two, they're two different things. They can be associated but they need not be. You have to be careful about that uh, lineage of, uh, and, and methods as well. It's only partially achieved by appropriate structure, thoughtful mending, thoughtful application of adhesive, and thoughtful integration of original and supplied materials are also required. The result, when achieved, provides an aesthetic gratification augmented by a practical satisfaction. The conservator alone may appreciate the result and convey it in the completed repair or rebinding with a pride in its mobility as a crucial result not apparent in outward appearances. Well, I thought I was finished then, because um, I had those four offhand uh, comments. Uh, and then I came right back to, uh, it occurred to me, right back to where I was before, the stance of the uh, book conservator. And so I had to throw in this freebie at the end, the, uh, the fifth uh, aesthetic uh, of book conservation. It would seem, I mean, it logical that uh, the practitioner is is dedicated to preserving the past. But I'm beginning to wonder if the role of the book conservator is as much assuring the future of uh, the print collections and the books. And wherever that leads should be, just as to whether or not you saw in the kettle stitch, should be a conscious decision. I, this is an interesting one. I, I probably got it flipped. Um, what, what, what would the book conservator do? I can see the, I can see the, uh, the symbol is Chinese gr uh, for book. It's on the top and on the bottom. Um, what should the book conservator do to assure the future of the books? Well, one is, uh, as I said, to argue for the continuing role of the original in the context of digital delivery. But it's also to be uh, keen and aware of where the status of the, the book is going and what the differentiations are. Um, there, uh, we won't go off on this, this sidebar for now, but I thought it was elucidated. Uh, the future of the book's not that uh, uh, simple or straightforward. For one thing, uh, there's a difference between the future of the book and the book of the future. Much of, much of the uh, digital enthusiasm is for uh, if you will, the book of the future, uh, the, the book of Tomorrowland. And in fact, what's different in the Chinese is, are the two futures. One is, is kind of a Tomorrowland, and the other is the authentic things to come. Uh, and I think that's a, a key, key issue. We have a lot of momentum and uh, legacy in our traditional library collections, but we also have a lot of potency uh, it's going to be ironic, but I wouldn't be surprised if the digital revolution does more for print-based reading than it does for screen-based reading. And already, uh, so many of the uh, dependencies on the physical book are becoming apparent. Three very important ones. The print book is more legible. It has greater haptic efficiency and by far more persistence. When I say legible, I'm not talking about resolution. There's every indication that the incubator niche for the ebook is the cell phone, in which case the resolution will be small. <laughs> now, the, uh, the legibility I'm talking about is the 
immediacy, the efficiency uh, of the visual presentation of text. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, a lot of uh, debate now on the future of subject uh, heading classification, and one librarian said, I can go to the stacks uh, in a classified order. I can take a dozen books down, fan through them, find exactly the one I, w I want with the uh, uh, correct approach uh, within three minutes. Try doing that uh, in an electronic search. Uh, in other words, what that is referring to is legibility. You can fan through a book, and I mean, this just happens to be a, an example. Uh, haptic uh, efficiency is very much more embedded. We don't really uh, appreciate it. Uh, it's almost an ergonomic of comprehension. Our hands actually prompt the, um, if you will, the, uh, the precepts or the concepts of the, the text into our minds a very deeply embedded uh, capacity that we have that's embedded in the, the paper book. And then finally, persistence. We all know, to, know about that and the non-persistence of the media. So those are three clues or indicators that, of a stance, an aesthetic stance that the book conservator uh, can take today meaningfully uh, in defense of the, uh, the artifactual collections. I hope I haven't uh, um, corrupted or otherwise uh, uh, distorted, uh, and I certainly hope I haven't dis distorted the, the few things I've tried to, to present about the aesthetics of the, the book conservator. It's, it's a completely um, obscure, maybe arcane uh, thing to talk about, but I can tell you this, that it is what drives the practitioner and it is the source of uh, the practitioner's inspiration. Thank you very much. Yes, there, there are two uh, disciplines uh, involved. One is in the uh, engineering uh, domain, and that, uh, that is the haptics, incidentally, is the study of touch as a, a mode of communication. Uh, but its applications and where you'll find um, much of the material is in, actually in engineering. Uh, for example, haptical devices uh, weld cars. They simply simulate all the uh, bionic uh, motions. The other is in uh, psychology, um, the um, uh, readability studies, where, for example, psychologists will uh, take undergraduate, volunteer undergraduates and uh, ask them to read one text on the screen and one uh, in paper, and then evaluate uh, the uh, comprehension uh, levels that have occurred. Uh, I would add a third uh, area, and that's um, epistemological evolution, evolutionary epistemology. And that is a, an area, a very good uh, new book, uh, Wetzel uh, von uh, Hoistings, a Dutch, uh, German, uh, um, Dutch uh, South African author, wonderful book on the emergence of symbolic thought. Where is that, where is that stuff located? It's often the physical uh, anthropology, it's often um, not in ethnography, but physical anthropology, goes all the way back. And what happened was, uh, I'll give you the, the very short version, uh, because I love to give this, <laughs> this little sidebar, but uh, I, hope, I hope I'm not uh, overreaching. Um, how did our brains get so big? <laughs> well, it uh, turns out uh, that primate dexterity is the precursive uh, engine behind uh, the enlarging, uh, uh, speciating uh, enlargement of, of the brains. And in fact, it was the hands prompting the mind. Um, manipulation, tactile uh, observation, haptical uh, investigation of the surrounding uh, food sources and all led a non-essentially uh, uh, terrestrial 
uh, primates in uh, eastern Africa down that course, and there uh, they they got their they evolved in a way in which they be, their minds were were enhanced. Do you know that um, we are the only uh, species uh, that, is, that is strongly handed? We did, uh, it's related to um, projectile predation, throwing rocks. Uh, other primates tried to throw the rocks with two hands. We learned over and over to throw with one hand. Uh, it uh, produced an asymmet neurological asymmetry. Uh, Frank Wilson would be the good secondary source on that, the hand. And all of these things, you see how far back I'm going. Uh, all of these things play into uh, the haptic efficiency of the, uh, the book. The book is nothing more than a thrown projectile. There's a, a missile and a, a missile, the, the liturgical book, are very close. Um, it is something that is carefully weighed, carefully evaluated, subjected to a lot of practice, uh, released with a, a great deal of anticipation toward a moving target with the intention of stunning the target. There's no better description of uh, a monographic book. <laughs> and so it's, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, closing a circle here. So haptic efficiency is fundamental, and the problem is it's invisible. You can find it in, in, as I said, in psychology and engineering, but also look in um, uh, that topic, uh, uh, evolutionary epistemology. You mentioned that the librarian took down 10 books. Yes. And this is come from the original book of Genesis at the time. And she was able to was able to search in uh, the physical book with great, um, what we'll call, in that case, um, uh, discovery success. Okay, because the kids here at the university will tell you, I can do the same thing online. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, it is interesting. Here's, here's my take on This is another short story. I love to tell this one. Uh, what signals the transition in communication technologies between analog and digital. What signals? Well, you would never guess. It's the delete key. There is no delete key at the printer's case. There's no delete key on the linotype machine. There's a delete key in electronic text and in the keyboard associated with electronic text. Why is this important? Haptical efficiency is based on the ability to get through a complicated sequence of concepts, retain them, and go on to relate them to other concepts, as in other books. If you spend most of your day deleting spam, s filtering by, by eye, by hand, tens of thousands of Google hits that are just parsed words, you're actually spending a lot of your conceptual uh, investment in deletion. And I think that's where some of the, uh, if you will, haptical inner inefficiency of the screen-based reading, it doesn't mean that they're not symbiotic, symbio symbiotic is the way I would put it. Not, in other words, they, they're two forms that relate to one another. Librarians are, are very uh, precocial in this regard. We've had online catalogs for 30 years now. So we're very keen, uh, speaking for librarians, uh, the librarians are very keen uh, to integrate uh, the two interfaces. If young readers tell you that they're dependent on the screen, if older enthusiasts for the screen say, wait until they're old and they will no longer read books. I will only say that if that were true, uh, I would be watching much more television than I did as a kid. Young readers are perennially oriented toward audio and visual media. Older readers are ready for um, what we'll call linear textual uh, concepts. And so that's, that's a timeless feature 
um, there, there isn't going to uh, be a, uh, so to speak, a, a sudden transition. In fact, the one-way transition is probably the easiest fallacy of it all, that uh, the screen will replace the, the paper book. Sorry. Yes, please. It's called attention span. It's because of the high skills of, of deletion, yeah, and uh, uh, you know be beyond uh, that. Uh, that's a that's a wonderful expression that you've you've offered uh, there, uh, of exactly uh, what's perhaps at, at stake. Uh, the only th other third quality that relates is persistence itself. Uh, the actual uh, retrievability. Many times the concepts are brought to bear uh, much later in different culture contexts where they, they fill out their meanings. Uh, the, the famous, the wonderful find of the uh, codices at Nahamadi in the jar, the fourth century codices, have uh, brought to the contemporary world and to scholarship in uh, theology and the history of uh, religions a whole new sector of the philosophies of sectarians and uh, Gnostic uh, scripture immediately open the jar and the scholars read the Greek letter Coptic book 16 centuries later wonderful library preservation technology but I, I will also offer uh, to those that would advocate transmitting our, our culture digitally, which is the more advanced technology in terms of reliable transmission of knowledge across time and cultures, the papyrus codex or computer media? I phrased, phrased that question in a way that makes it obvious that one can convey forward reliably across 16 centuries, another has a reach uh, of five to 10 years, depending on which, which aspect of retrievability uh, is, is the shortest. So yes, uh, a comparison not only from book to book, but uh, across time and cultures, uh, there, there's that haptical aspect, and that, that's related to its persistence. Paper book. These are wonderful questions. I don't know how you've managed uh, to, to prompt all these. Uh, Excellent questions. <laughs> yes. No, I. I, I'm, I'm a wonderful advocate of uh, doing this. I um, also, I, I'm a complete advocate, I should say, not a wonderful advocate, but a complete advocate uh, of, of doing this, uh, of scanning or imaging uh, the books. As far as the physical jeopardy, it is, it is not great. It's interesting um, uh, to re uh, machine read a book, uh, we essentially face it toward another reader, uh, and this is done liturgically in books, uh, where the book was opened out by the clergy person to the audience to show it. Uh, that's the, uh, an allegory, if you will, of machine reading. You open it out uh, to something else, but I think it's, it's wonderful that uh, the traditional codex is simultaneously machine readable and eye readable without any modification whatsoever. Try that with computer media. Try to read uh, a laser bit uh, uh, inscription. <laughs> uh, not to mention all the code transitions that it's gone through to, to bring it up on the screen. Yes?
shelf and told me I was well booked and trained enough. That has more to do with the organization. Very good. Than Very than good. Itself. And the codex enabled by its form a certain way of looking at information that the scroll cannot. And I'm wondering if um, maybe the, the lesson is not one of antipathy to the digital, but perhaps a new way of organizing digital media that is based around the principles that make the book so useful. Yes. Uh, there, there are three, at least three defining characteristics of a search library in the past. One is the definition of the book itself, the bibliographical integrity, because books can stand alone, they can be shelved adjoining one another, you can make this, this, this uh, order. But the book itself, as a, as a conceptual work, has that integrity. Generally, screen-based searches and screen-based presentations parse that down to words and sentences. It dissolves the book. So that's one defining characteristic of the library thrown overboard. Then we go on to yours. What if you throw overboard the classified arrangement of the books? Remember the classified arrangement is not only the cascade that enables you to find the citation, it's also a mirror of a physical place in the library. Um, that defining characteristic is in jeopardy now. Why not just Google the books? Um, in the storage building, uh, of course, I'm against it. <laughs> uh, there'll be five different sizes of books. It reminds me, when I first started at the Newbury as a page, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to shelve them by color? <laughs> Well, it's, it's fine, but it's proprietary software. All you need is a little downtime. All you need is a little human error in, uh, built into the system. And a book is truly lost. Try to find it. Whereas, we could turn up the lights in, in any classified library, go in the flashlight, and I could find uh, evolutionary epistemology in the dark because it's there in a physical location. I know where to get to. The third defining characteristic, and that's in jeopardy. Uh, the, not, not the librarians, but the administrators at the Library of Congress are seriously uh, considering this. Uh, subject headings, they're getting away from them. Human, uh, human provided subject headings. The third defining characteristic, we give up all three and we're really, we're really open ocean. The third defining characteristic, the digital enthusiasts will say, well, the, the undergraduates won't come to the library. They've got to have the books in their dormitory. Well, since when have research libraries been designed based on the convenience of undergraduates? Uh, in other words, that is not the whole defining issue uh, here. So if you, if you throw away all those things, the integrity of the, the book itself by parsing it into words, the uh, sacrifice of the classified order not only as a finding tool, but as a, a physical location. And the patron base, serious researchers. There are some topics that only five people in the world are interested in and are expert in, and they need to go and find a book in your library that no one has ever touched. And uh, that is the function. It's a hard sell, but that is the function of a research library. So those are three uh, issues at, at, in jeopardy and at, at stake. Uh, the book conservator, I think, is on the right side of, of, of these aesthetically and, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, uh, methodologically. Thanks. Very good. Boy, we, co we covered some ground here. <laughs> Peter, have we done? Uh, are, are there other issues to bring forward? <laughs> well, I want to thank you all uh, uh, for the wonderful uh, questions and uh, uh, all your attention. <laughs> thank you.